This is Tempe. We just woke him up so he's a little bit nervous. Tempe is an African pygmy hedgehog. And even though he's a tiny little guy that lives in Africa and lives alongside of some very large predators, he's safe. And it's because he's got a bad hair day every day. His prickly hair helps to protect him if an animal comes up and tries to have him for lunch. Uh, very quickly they'll spit him back out. And it's just one of the really neat adaptations that animals have to survive in the wild. Another thing about him that's interesting is, as you notice, he's got a long skinny nose. He's very squirmy today, but I believe you can see his nose. Um, his nose is what he uses to find his food. Tempe, um, unlike people, eats insects. And that's what he's designed by nature to do. But again, as he's out looking for his food, looking for insects to eat, if danger comes along, all he's got to do is what he's doing right now, curl up into a ball, and he's totally protected from danger and larger animals. It's a great feature to have if you're such a little guy. Um, another thing that's interesting about hedgehogs is, is that they are an animal that is constantly on the go. Even though they have these tiny, short little legs, they have to constantly be looking for the next meal because their, their meal always comes in a small package. And they're constantly on the go. And again, that's a great reason for them to have that extra protection that they can take with them everywhere that they go, which is their sharp, prickly hair. Uh, just like he is right now, somewhat relaxed, but not totally relaxed, Tempe is an animal that I can rub, and we use him a lot in our programs and allow kids to experience something a little bit different than what they're used to. Let them learn about animals and see how animals live and survive differently in the wild in a lot of different places. I want to introduce you to um, an animal that I think is very interesting. It's an animal, unlike the hedgehog, it's an animal that lives here in North Carolina. But it's not an animal that most people are likely to see. Now certainly, we do have lots of snakes in North Carolina, a lot of different species, but this particular species is fairly uncommon. And it is a northern pine snake. And pine snakes have become very rare in North Carolina because we have altered the landscape over the past couple of hundred years. When colonists first arrived to the North Carolina coast and started settling its shores, there were over 93 million acres of longleaf pine forest on our Atlantic seaboard and parts of our Gulf Coast. And that pine forest is the particular habitat that pine snakes, hence their name, chose to live in. They're designed to live there. You can see their coloration if you can imagine pine needles and sandy soils. They blend right in and it's great protection and camouflage for them but also they use the loose soils because in their habitat they're designed to be one of the few snakes that actually digs. And they have to dig for a couple of different reasons. One reason is, and they're kind of related reasons actually, one reason is is that in the summer it gets pretty hot and snakes being cold-blooded animals have to escape the heat. So they may dig to make a burrow to get down underground to get away from the heat in the hot part of the day. And those sandy soils and pine needles really help with that aspect. They also may need to dig in the wintertime, like all snakes do, to find a place to spend the winter below the cold, frigid temperatures above. So their digging abilities and their camouflage makes them an excellent animal to live in those sandy soils that longleaf pines grow. The reason that they become so rare is that as North Carolina and a lot of other states were settled by Europeans, one thing that we did not want that the Native Americans actually used quite a bit was fire. Fire would destroy our, our villages and our, our structures that were a lot more stationary than what the Native Americans lived in. And so if a fire sprung up, we would put it out. And we've gotten so good at putting out fires that we've changed the habitat of North Carolina in a lot of places. The longleaf pine tree is very dependent upon fire. Fire allows it to outcompete other trees, and since it can no longer outcompete, then as a result of that, the forest has disappeared and the snake has disappeared as well. Pine snakes, like most medium-sized snakes, are rodent eaters. They eat rats and mice and voles and other rodents that you find in the wild. Um, they are not typically a constrictor in the sense that most people think of, they don't wrap their bodies around their prey and squeeze it, but they do kill their prey by squeezing it. 
And they usually do this by finding their food in its burrows underground. And they'll use their strong muscles to actually press the prey against the walls of its own burrow to squeeze it and kill it and then eat it. Very interesting snake. You can see it sticking its tongue out quite a bit. Snakes are very dependent upon their sense of smell. Since they lack ears and have very poor vision, most of what they learn about what's going on in their world has to do with their ability to smell it. And as every child knows, a snake smells with its tongue. Each time its tongue comes out, it catches the smell particles that are in the air, pulls them back into its mouth where its ability to smell is greatly heightened, and then it can use that greater smell ability to tell a lot of things about what's going on in its world. The forked tongue actually helps the snake to determine which direction a smell is coming from because each tip of the tongue will pick up a different level of concentration of the smells and if there's more concentration on the right that means the smell comes from the right and this allows them to track down their food and to avoid other larger predators as well. Snakes are very cool in a lot of different ways. One of the things that makes people a little bit nervous about snakes is the fact that they slide around on their bellies as if they're slimy. But if you were to touch a snake like I'm doing right now, you'd see that they're not slimy at all. They're smooth, scaly. Some different snakes are a little bit rougher than this one is to the texture, but not wet and slimy at all. They slide because every movement that they make, and I'm gonna turn them around where you can see a little bit better here, is done by their scales on the bottom of their belly grabbing the ground and pulling them along as they go. Uh, it's a very efficient way to move and not only does it let them move on flat surfaces, but they can climb some pretty vertical surfaces by using those wide scales to grab the ground and pull themselves along. I think snakes and I think most people that learn about snakes would agree, the more we know about them, the more interesting they are as animals and they have some really cool adaptations for survival. And this is Screechy, our resident Screech Owl here at Dan Nicholas Park Nature Center. Uh, Screechy is a very interesting little creature and he is one of our favorite program animals. He probably gets more oohs and ahs than any other animal that we have. When we bring him out for school children to see, everybody automatically assumes that he's a baby owl. But actually this species of owl, the Screech Owl, the Eastern Screech Owl, doesn't get any larger than this. Screechy's kind of like me, he's an older man now, and um, he's probably in the neighborhood of nine years old. With screech owls, their lifespan and their life expectancy is about 13, so he's no longer a baby and hasn't been that way for a long time. Early on in his life, he ran into a little bit of a problem. He flew down to catch something in front of a car, and that's why you'll notice that his right wing droops a little bit. Like all of our birds of prey that we have here at Dan Nicholas Park, Screechy could not take care of himself in the wild. And that's why he's a great ambassador. We get to take care of him, and he gets to take care of his wild cousins by letting people learn about screech owls. Owls, as a rule, are very, very cool creatures. They're designed to do something that not anything else can do very well, not, at least not very many other creatures can do very well, and that is, is to be a predator that flies in the darkness. They have a lot of different adaptations that allow them to do this. One thing that they have is incredible eyesight. Just comparatively speaking, if a screech owl's, if we had eyes the size of a screech owl's eyes, they would be as big as softballs. Their eyes are so large in their skull that they can't move inside their skull and therefore they have to turn their head to see something. Nature's compensated for that by giving them extra space between their neck bones even though um, they have something that looks like they have no neck, their neck is very small, probably about the size of my little finger, with lots of extra bones and space between the bones so that they can turn their head all the way around. In fact, an owl can turn its head three quarters of the way around. Another great feature that they have that helps them even more beyond their eyesight is incredible hearing. Owls have a great ability to hear, not because they have big ears, like a dog does, but because they have a facial disc, the pattern on the side of their face that makes their feathers look flat, that lets them capture sound. 
So basically they can swing their head around and it's just like a big radar dish scanning the night for the sound. And they're very good at determining exactly where a sound comes from because their ear openings on either side of their head are all set vertically. This allows them to sit up, into a tree, sit up in the top of a tree, look out over a forest, scan for sounds, pinpoint a sound, and determine not only exactly which direction it came from, but which angle up and down it came from as well. As they dive after their prey, they precisely line up their feet, which is the tool with their talons that they use to catch their prey, with their ears, and drop down out of the night sky onto their prey. Screech owls aren't big ferocious predators like some of their bigger cousins. They eat mainly things like insects, mice, small lizards, and small snakes. <clears throat> but they're very efficient predators, and for their size, they're probably as tough as any of their bigger cousins. All right, I want to introduce you to Becky now. I think most people will recognize the type of animal that Becky is. She loves grapes. Uh, the full name of this animal is a Virginia opossum. She takes a little bit of time coming out sometimes, but usually the grapes get it done. Virginia opossums are found all over North Carolina, all over the southeastern United States, and are actually expanding their range. They benefit from getting to know about humans because once they learn that people are a good source of food with all the things that we throw away, they'll come and visit us on a regular basis. They also very quickly learn that people feed their pets outside, and a lot of pet owners are surprised to find an opossum instead of a cat eating out of their cat's dish in the morning. Virginia possums are unique as far as North American mammals because they are our only marsupial. When people think of marsupials, they're usually thinking of something like a kangaroo, and automatically everybody knows what a kangaroo has that other animals don't. They have a pouch. Mother possums raise their young in a pouch. And it's a great advantage to have, even though we consider these guys primitive animals, in that they have that pouch that they, after their babies are born at a very young, a very undeveloped size, the mother possum can then carry their babies until they develop further anywhere that they want to go. Opossums can have up to 20 young, but they only have the ability and the places, the feeding stations for 13 babies. When the babies are first born, they're very small. They're only about the size of the end of my little finger. And the mother licks a path from the birth canal to, their, to her pouch, and the babies go in the pouch, and then they stay there for a longer period of time for further development. Now, after a while, 13 babies inside a pouch on a mother's belly gets a little bit crowded. And so then those babies um, will come out of the pouch, and they have very, if you can see Becky's fingers, they have very long toes, and even on their hind feet, they have an opposable toe like our thumb that they can use to grasp their mother's fur. And so a lot of times during the late spring, you'll see, if you're lucky enough to see a possum in the wild, you'll see babies, lots of little heads, clinging to mother's back and riding along for the ride. Opossums are um, very, they're animals that are constantly on the move. They're very uh, ambulatory animals. They're constantly moving around looking for the next meal. And if you're a possum, you're not very picky. They'll eat everything from fruit, like these grapes, to insects, to other plants, and even will eat carrion, which is dead animals. And that's one thing that gets in, them into a lot of trouble. Uh, they're fairly nearsighted, and if they get onto a road looking for something to eat, they may often get hit by cars, unfortunately. Possums are nearsighted, like I just mentioned. They do f very effectively find their food, though, because if you look at Becky's long nose, you can imagine that she's got a great sense of smell and she's constantly on the move looking for that next meal. One of the things that possums are known for that I haven't mentioned yet is, is the way they defend themselves. First of all, you probably noticed when Becky was eating these grapes that she has some pretty serious teeth. Let's get her some more food here. They have some pretty serious teeth that one of the disadvantages of having her loose 
has some pretty serious teeth that they can uh, bite you with. But usually that's not what they do. Now they will show you their teeth in defense and hiss at you if you scare them, but they typically don't bite. Their defense, believe it or not, is to play dead, playing possum. And they'll lie on their backs, open their mouth and let their tongue hang out the side of their mouth. Their heart rate even slows down. Nature has built in a defense that works great for these guys that really doesn't require them to fight. They just give up. And the reason that this works is a lot of predatory animals are very reluctant to eat something that they think has died from another reason that they did not cause. They're afraid or nature has taught them instinctively that possibly this animal could be diseased. So possums save themselves a lot of times from danger just by giving up.